What do tea, cake and abolition have in common? The simple answer is sugar. The Whig MP William Fox used this indulgent treat in his campaign against slavery. He stated that for every pound of sugar used is considered as consuming two ounces of human flesh. Sugar was imported from the West Indies where slaves were kept in inhumane conditions. By the end of the 18th century, 400,000 slaves had died due to the increasing demand of sugar on the tables of Britain. What was once considered a luxury had now become commonplace. Whilst William Wilberforce remains a household name for the abolition of slavery, outside of Parliament, the campaign was led mostly by women. In 1791, it was Martha Gurney that aided Fox in creating his radical pamphlets on the anti-slave trade movement. The Quaker Elizabeth Hyrett produced thousands of pamphlets that were spread around the USA and Britain bringing home the reality of slavery to British and American citizens. An area in which women were very prominent was the sugar boycott. One husband quoted that, in his absence, the females in his family had entirely left off the use of sugar and banished it from the tea table. At the height of the movement, 400,000 people had given up sugar from the West Indies. They were either buying from the East Indies, where sales increased tenfold, or boycotting it entirely. Many women's societies were inspired by Elizabeth Hayrick and also began advertising the boycott. In many ways, this is the equivalent of the modern fair trade campaign. The boycott came up against some powerful vested interests. Many people made their fortunes off the slave trade, and it was for this reason that Parliament rejected the Abolition Bill in 1791. An example of this is Michael Renwick Sargent, a merchant from Liverpool. He is quoted saying that we ought to consider, consider whether the Negroes in a well-regulated plantation, under the protection of a kind master, do not enjoy as great, nay, even greater advantages than when under their own despotic governments. While the decision to abolish slavery was ultimately made by Parliament, the MPs were responding to the public mood. Sugar sales had dropped by almost a third in the few months since the boycott had begun. By 1825, large areas of Leicester, the home of Elizabeth Hayrick, had given up sugar entirely. However, Britain still bought a wide range of goods made by slaves, such as tobacco or cotton, so the sugar boycott was largely symbolic. In the words of Elizabeth Hayrick, why petition Parliament at all to do that for us which we could do more speedily and effectively for ourselves? <laughs>